The next item of business is members' business debate on motion 15009 in the name of Mark Griffin on Marie Curie and Macmillan Cancer Support, getting it right for carers supporting someone at the end of life. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those who wish to speak to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Mark Griffin to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm uh, grateful to uh, members who, in supporting this motion, have made this afternoon's debate possible. And I'm also grateful to Mr Fitzpatrick for his interest in the, the issue today. Over the Christmas period, nearly 100,000 people in Scotland will have spent their time caring for someone with a terminal illness. And it's estimated that each year approximately 40 to 46 thousand people in Scotland with a terminal illness will pass away. It's tragic that for some that may have been their last Christmas together. And it goes without saying that even if you try to cherish every last moment with a loved one, the impending loss can cause anyone to grieve before that person passes. And on top of that heartbreak, the, the person caring for their loved one has a new demanding experience requiring them to get to grips with the terminal ill person's condition their decline and the public services that they come to rely on. They face new problems every single day and it's the time when carers need the most help. It's precisely when society and the NHS should be stepping in to provide intensive help for all involved. So getting it right for carers, supporting someone at the end of life is an important report. It highlights the problems faced by carers, especially those looking after someone who's terminally ill and approaching the end of their lives. Now I want to thank uh, Marie Curie and Macmillan for their work on this. Particularly, I wanted to thank the research team, Susan Swan, Emma Cardiff, uh, Richard Mead of uh, Marie Curie, as well as Macmillan, the Scottish Government Carers Centres, and especially the carers who took part and shared their very, very personal stories. But regardless of the, the time of year, um, out of love and kindness, Carers dedicate themselves to friends and relatives. They save the NHS billions. They thrive in their roles and enhance the quality of life for those they care for. And we know many carers will experience ill health themselves. The impetus behind the Carers Act, which has now been implemented, attempts to respond to that sorry reality. Exhausted physically and emotionally, frightened and unsure, some carers are sadly overwhelmed by the demands, the demands on them. The report highlights that caring for someone who is terminally ill can be complex, highly demanding, and at times all-consuming. Many carers will watch as their loved one gets support, while they themselves are rarely asked about what help they need. One carer told researchers underlining the desperation, I, I didn't even think, where can I go for help? And it's perhaps just one example, but the report cites many more. Another told them, it's the bashing your head against a brick wall. It's going from crisis to crisis. Another one said, I started seeing myself as a carer when I was taken into hospital one night with a suspected heart attack because I was so stressed. And carers need support to help them to care. Of course, um, they, when they do, um, um, when they don't have that uh, support, um, when that um, support is, is not there, they put th their own health um, at risk. So it's vitally important that councils and government ensure adult carer support plans or young carer statements are requested and agreed. And I, I hope the Minister will be able to say um, today how many plans have been requested and completed. With the support of Marie Curie, I attempted last year to amend the Social Security Bill to ensure carers get their allowance fast-tracked alongside the benefit for someone who is terminally ill. Like that, the fast-tracking of the plans for, for carers of terminally ill people could make the difference for some carers getting support in time or not. And I hope the Minister can say when that fast-tracking will come into force. The report makes clear that the mental and physical stress of caring and beginning to lose someone impacts hugely on their ability to grieve after bereavement and on their long-term quality of life. 
and the, the chance to talk about their role, getting peer support or having a break from caring, whether that's a, a day or just a, a few hours, are all referenced as being vitally important to improve that situation. 2018 also saw the introduction of the Carers Allowance Supplement for low-income carers. And that financial support is the start on the journey on recognising the contribution of carers. And I was delighted to support and improve that measure to protect it from inflation. And though I've been critical of the government's decision to leave carers allowance in the hands of the DWP for now, these powers must be used with the backing of carers. And that's precisely why I've begun asking carers how long that financial support should continue once the cared for person passes or they go into a hospital long term. In both cases, the carers who have given so much to care for their loved one are expected just to return to a life that they had before caring with no support and no financial assistance, almost as, to, as if someone can automatically just pick up their job where they left off. So if we're ambitious with the, the new powers, these are changes that I hope we can make for carers in this parliament so that there is less financial stress while um, caring too. Presiding officer, one of the most intriguing parts of the report is the, the difficulties that we encounter in identifying carers. Many people see themselves not as a, a carer, but rather as a mother, a husband, a son, a sister, a friend, or, or sometimes a neighbor. And as a result, they won't ask for help or even think they're entitled to help because they don't consider themselves a carer. They are just doing what um, they would expect of themselves for someone that they, that they love. And it's clear from the Marie Curie and Macmillan study that tragically there are too many missed opportunities to identify those carers. And fundamentally, the research shows that when carers are identified and get support, it makes a huge difference. Now we need to do more um, on that identification so that plans can be in place um, and a carer's own health is supported. And whether it's GPs and district nurses, uh, social care staff, third sector workers, loved ones, family members and friends, everyone has a, a part to play. And I hope the, the minister can say how across government and communities we can better identify carers for people who are terminally ill to make sure they get the support that they need. Now, caring for someone at the end of their lives will be one of the most difficult and challenging experiences for people and families to face. Um, people decline quickly and as it does, the carer needs um, um, support to be increased rapidly. Those last stages of life are painful and tragic. Carers struggle to keep up with the loss physically and emotionally, but we can step in to help them through. It's important that we help them through and this report shows the areas where we must focus that support to improve the, the lives of carers and I look forward to hearing from other members and the government's response to that report. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the open debate. I have quite a few speaking requests. So can I ask members please to go no further than four minutes in their contribution. And I call Bill Kidd to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you very much, President Officer, and I'd also like to thank, uh, start by thanking Mark Griffin. Um, this is a hugely important topic, and bringing this for debate here to the Parliament is something that is really required. And I'd like to also thank uh, both Marie Curie and Macmillan Cancer Support uh, for their joint report on getting it right for carers. This is an important, complex and emotive subject, and it's crucial that this member's debate brings increased awareness of carers rights. The carers charter outlines a carers right to an adult carer support plan from the given local authority and the process of identifying a carers needs through this plan should happen as quickly as possible. This means support is provided when it is needed. Two aspects are particularly important for ensuring a swift provision of support. The first is identifying carers and the second is increased awareness of their rights. The report recommends that identification is everyone's responsibility and it highlights GPs and district nurses as professionals well placed to do so. The presumption should be that a patient with a terminal illness has a carer looking after them. 
Early identification can lead to health professionals proposing an adult carer support plan or to the carer directly requesting that plan. The Carers Charter promotes both routes towards receiving support. In Glasgow Annie's land, we are particularly appreciative of the work done by Macmillan in providing support and information to carers and patients at the Beetson Cancer Centre at Garton Abel. Services like this can signpost carers' rights to people amidst an emotional and difficult time. And Marie Curie has also provided significant support to people with facing this situation of caring for a loved one with a terminal illness. In 2017-18, Marie Curie volunteers visited families more than 10,000 times to provide face-to-face -face support. That, we can all agree, is an incredible and very valuable effort. In the final stages of the care for person's life, the carer is rightly focused on how they can best support their loved one. In this very difficult time, the physical and emotional needs of the carer can often, however, be put to the side, as was mentioned uh, by Mark Griffin earlier. There can often also be an increased financial burden on carers, particularly if they have had to stop working. The report highlights that if the carer has unmet needs, then there may be a detrimental effect on that carer. In the last three months of the cared for person's life, a carer will be looking after uh, their loved one for an average of 70 hours a week and will often have poor sleep patterns. The combination of these different factors can often, for example, lead to carers becoming more susceptible themselves to viruses and other illnesses. The report warns that unmet carer support needs could potentially lead to a breakdown of care and to greater complexities in the healthcare provision required. Quick provision of support for carers is pivotal. It can avoid the breakdown of care and treats family member carers with the dignity and the care themselves that they deserve in a difficult time. Identifying who is a carer is, and assessing the needs quickly, is a key part of enabling quick provision of support. The report thoroughly evidences this, and support for carers increases. We need to get the message out about what their rights are and how they can access them. And it's my hope that this debate goes some way in achieving that. And thank you very much. At Brian Whittle, followed by Monica Lennon. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by also adding my congratulations to Mark Griffin for securing time in this chamber for what uh, Bill Kidd has said uh, as a debate, an important topic. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to contribute. I think many of us uh, in here will have some experience in this when, when family members or friends uh, approach end of life. Um, uh, my uh, grandmother died from cancer in the Isher Hospice some years ago, and, and the care she, uh, my grandfather, and my family received helped us immeasurably uh, with that uh, difficult time. Uh, my grandfather also died not long after in the care of another hospice uh, uh, from accelerated dementia. Prior to entering into the hospices, the, the family gave as much support as we possibly could. I was really lucky at the time uh, because my grandparents didn't live too far from me uh, and I was involved in sport and it allowed me to drop in uh, every single day. And, and my father was self-employed and he also had that certain amount of flexibility allowing him to spend time every day with my grandparents. And I recognise this is not necessarily a situation available to all families. And I wonder how my grandfather would have coped Firstly, with my grandmother's situation as her health deteriorated and then his own health uh, had the family not been close by and able to help and then finally receiving <coughs> the very best of care uh, from the hospice. The truth is, as pointed out in the Marie Curie and Macmillan Cancer Support Report and in Mark Griffin's motion, too many people do not receive this kind of dignified support as they approach uh, the end of life. A quarter of people miss the palliative care they need according to the report leading to that accelerated deterioration of their condition. Crucially, though, the support for the carers and their health is not often considered. The pressure they are under balancing their lives, often with families to care for, while caring for terminally ill relatives, is all too frequently overlooked. And I've often said in this chamber that we need to consider the health of our healthcare professionals as they care for us. And that very same ethos should be applied to those who are caring for someone else with a terminal illness. If we don't ensure that the carers themselves are looked after, then they will be in danger of falling into ill health to the detriment of both them and those that they are caring for. We need to recognise there is a huge pressure on the carer as they manage the decline of a relative. And recognise the stress and worry associated with the thought 
what will happen if something happens to me. This is where I believe primary care should have a big role to play. And ac across the chamber, I think there's an agreement there needs to be a shift from secondary care into that sort of community care. And this is a, a, a very good case in question. I think GPs and district nurseries should be able to firstly identify those in a caring role. And I think also they should be able to self-refer. And secondly, and crucially, be able to direct them and their families to the help that they need. It's about communication. It's about developing a system that is easy to access and to utilise. Technology will inevitably play a key role in developing such a system, which, if properly enabled, will potentially help prevent the need for some GP appointments and hospital visits. So in, in that respect, it's not necessarily just about increasing investment every time. It's about better utilisation of resource. GPs are under increasing pressure, we know. So in developing these systems, we must always ensure that they are designed to take the burden away from the GPs as well, making them easy to access and to use. The outcome is end-of-life care that allows the patient peace, dignity and respect for the carers and family members, the breathing space to keep that stress at bay and allowing the family and the patient quality time together. Can I just put on, my, on record uh, our thanks to Marie Curie and Macmillan Cancer Support for bringing us this report and to all carers, professional or otherwise, who deliver palliative care and, uh, to, and comfort in the, in the most trying of circumstances. Understanding and identifying those who are carers and being able to signpost them to the help and support they require. That's what we are debating today. Deputy Presenting Officer, it does not seem too much of an ask. Monica Lennon, followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Mark Griffin, first of all, for being a, a tireless champion for carers, but also for securing this important debate today, which I know is close to the hearts of many people across Scotland. I fully support the motion and commend Marie Curie and the Macmillan Cancer Support team for their report, highlighting the needs of people who are caring for loved ones towards the end of their lives. And I thank them for the briefings I've provided for this debate. In central Scotland, the parliamentary region that I share with Mark Griffin, over 7,000 people need palliative care every year and countless friends and relatives and loved ones are involved in providing care. As others have said, caring for carers is, is hugely important and I'm grateful that in my area of Lanarkshire, carers have the support of 45 nurses and 94 volunteers through Marie Curie and the wonderful services of Lanarkshire Carers Centre and others. And Lanarkshire Carers Centres have many times pointed out to me that you know, meaningful conversations with carers can really make a difference and help people who are supporting loved ones towards the end of their life. And elsewhere in our region, there are 57 Marie Curie volunteers in Fort Valley and six nurses. This support is invaluable. And as I think Bill Kidd had mentioned, the Carers Scotland Act of 2016 places a duty on local authorities to prepare appropriate plans for carers. But Marie Curie and Macmillan's report uh, findings reinforce the complex nature of identifying carers because as Mark Griffin said many people care out of love and they don't see themselves as being carers and it can be difficult to, to get support to carers and when people who are carers do reach out for help because our health and social care system is so stretched it can mean that the system is not always joined up and people don't get the support that they desperately need so support must be available quickly as a de decline towards end of life and death can, can often be swifter than expected. And I think Bill Kidd you know, has powerfully warned that the breakdown of care is a, is, is a serious risk. So I will be interested to hear that the Minister's response to that. Other groups that I've met, including Together in Dementia Every Day, TIDE, um, talk about um, when someone has died, that there's not enough bereavement support for carers. And I'd like to hear what the Minister um, and the Government are, are doing to, to address that. When a terminal diagnosis um, um, is, is, is communicated to a family, it turns everyone's lives upside down. And others have talked about the, the financial impact, which can only make a, a bad situation even worse. Uh, people are having to take time off work, there are travel costs, uh, additional costs of getting to hospital and so on. And there's a big role for employers here. Um, employers can help prevent uh, families who are affected by terminal illness from falling into crisis. The Accredited Care Positive Scheme um, gives employers, um, or employers through that can give 
uh, carers' flexibility to deliver care at home. And the GMB trade union, of which I will declare that I am a member, and the TUC have the Dying to Work campaign. And that urges employers to offer greater employment protection to workers who are diagnosed with terminal illness and who want to carry on working and um, I, I'm eager to, to work with the Scottish Government to see what we can do in Scotland to, to get behind and to implement some of the, the measures through the, the Dying to Work campaign. In conclusion, presiding officer, caring for a loved one towards the end of their life is often described as, as a privilege and there is, there, there is love at the heart of, of this debate, as, as, as Mark Griffin's motion conveys. Carers are carrying out such an invaluable role for their families, but it's really important that we don't allow carers to become isolated and lonely and, and miss their own urgent medical appointments and put their own health at risk. So I'm grateful to Mark Griffin for the debate and I look forward to hearing the Minister's response. Thank you. Rona Mackay, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I too thank Mark Griffin for bringing this important debate to the Chamber? I'm very pleased to be speaking in it. In an unpredictable, ever-changing world, Marie Curie is a constant reassurance, like a big comfort blanket that gives people the knowledge that they or a family member or friend will have choice and dignity in the event of a terminal illness. In 2017 to 18, Marie Curie nurses cared for 32,692 people in the UK. The combined work hours of over 2,000 nursing staff members reached 1.2 million hours, work funded half by the NHS and half by charitable donations. Last year, Marie Curie invested £3.3 million in palliative care research. Over 4,000 people were involved in research studies funded by Marie Curie or carried out by their researchers. There are Marie Curie fundraising groups in my constituency in Bishop Briggs, Kirk and Tilloch, Lenzie and Bears Den, and they're just some of the 85 groups in Scotland doing fantastic work. But the latest research from Marie Curie, and I thank them for their briefing, and Macmillan Cancer Support has found that too many people caring for someone at the end of life are going unidentified and unsupported. Presiding officer, they rightly highlight that carers supporting someone at the end of life without support are at risk of falling into crisis themselves and a breakdown of care can follow. Carers need to be identified early, and, it's not everyone's and it is everyone's responsibility to identify them, not least GPs, social workers and district nurses, and signpost them to Marie Curie so that they can have at least have a break, even if just for a few hours. And financial, and financial support and advice is also vital for them to be aware of. Alarmingly, the Carers UK 2017 survey found the number of carers identified by GPs had fallen in the last three years with only 9% of carers reporting that their GP knew they were caring for someone. Presiding Officer Marie Curie is a household name. The problem is that carers often don't see themselves as carers, as uh, Mark Griffin has said and, and others have said. They see themselves as mothers, sons, brothers and friends, doing what they can, doing what they can out of love. So do not, they don't self-identify as carers or ask for help, often to the detriment of their own health. Physical care can quite a, uh, require a level of fitness and strength, which is increasingly difficult for carers to provide, especially with the ageing demographic of today's carers. Isolation combined with sleep deprivation and not always being free to leave the person they're caring for can have significant impact on their mental health, feelings of loneliness and well-being. Carers should know that Marie Curie is always there to step in and help them for their loved one with tenderness and professionalism. Another aspect of the charity is that it's always at the forefront of the ever-changing needs of society. And working with MND Scotland, they led a campaign for a fair definition of terminal illness to be included in the final Social Security Scotland Act. The new definition bases the de decision on clinical judgment, removing the last six months of life, res life restriction currently used by the DWP. They're now working to help shape the accompanying guidance. Marie Curie nurses give people with a terminal illness choice and dignity. Put simply, they're a fantastic charity. They make it possible for people faced with a terminal illness to have the choice to die peacefully in their own homes, surrounded by the people they love. None of us know when or, or if we will need the support of Marie Curie nurses, but we should all be eternally grateful that if we do, they will be there. Thank you. Alison Johnson, followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I too would like to thank Mark Griffin for bringing this important issue to the Chamber today and also Macmillan Cancer Care. 
and Marie Curie for their ongoing work and for this particular research. There are almost 800,000 carers, unpaid carers, including young carers in Scotland, and we know that they play a hugely valuable role in providing care, support and love to friends, family and neighbours in a whole variety of circumstances, often extremely challenging ones. And as Mark Griffin described so well, caring for someone at the end of their life can be especially difficult, as the report by Marie Curie and Macmillan Cancer Support highlights. Caring can be hugely rewarding, but also physically and emotionally demanding, and often all the more so when the cared for person is nearing the end of their life and often more intensive and complex care is required. And that's why I share the concerns expressed in the report and echoed by members today that we are struggling at times to identify carers in this situation. The report and the motion today emphasise the importance of primary healthcare professionals in identifying these carers but the report also reveals that in the past three years, the number of carers identified by GPs has fallen and only 9% of respondents to the Carers UK 2017 survey reported that their GP knew that they were caring and offered extra support to fit their caring role. Now we know that demands on GPs have never been greater, but we do need to increase awareness of recognising the carer's role um, amongst all professionals and wider society. And difficulty in identifying carers is especially worrying in the case of young people. My reading of the section on the, of the report on young carers is that we simply don't know how many young carers are caring for relatives at the end of their lives. And I would be grateful if the minister could address this in closing. And I'd also like to draw attention to what the report says about the support needs of carers after the person they have cared for has passed away. Caring for a loved one at the end of their lives can be all consuming. We might experience guilt, bewilderment, the loss of identity, the loss of purpose after the death. And the support for carers in this position isn't always what we would all want it to be. The report says that there was a general sense of being abandoned once the person had died. And many carers spoke of a sadness in the lack of professionals who offered condolences. In contrast, those carers who attended support services after their loved one had died spoke of the benefit of these services and of the benefits too of being able to access peer support during this time. Um, I'd also like to mention the excellent work that is going on amongst over 40 organisations and individuals who are involved in Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief um, initiative, working to encourage all of us in Scotland to be more open in the way that we discuss death, dying and bereavement. And before closing, I'd just like to focus on what the report found in relation to financial pr pressures on carers providing end-of-life care and the opportunities we now have have been mentioned with the devolution of carers allowance. The survey conducted for the report found that many of the carers were unsure of what financial support they were entitled to, with one saying they didn't even know what carers allowance was. And that's consistent for, with figures from Turn to Us, who suggest that across the UK, £1.3 billion worth of carers allowance to, to owed to over 400,000 people goes unclaimed every year. And this is at a time when costs can be incredibly high. And obviously, with so much going on, it's understandable that some of the carers weren't able to find the time to claim or didn't know that they could claim. So that being the case, I think raising awareness here is absolutely key. And I'd ask the minister to consider whether there might be scope to, to pay additional assistance to those carers who provide particularly intensive and demanding forms of support, such as caring for people at the end of their lives. Presiding officer, carers perform a highly valued role, often in dif difficult circumstances, none more perhaps when the person being cared for is coming to the end of their lives. We can't thank them enough, so it's vital that we reflect the importance of their role by offering the support they need, both while they are caring and after. The report shows that we aren't always doing that at the moment, and that needs to change. Thank you. Alex Paul Hamilton, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by echoing the thanks that's been offered to Mark Griffin for this important debate and too for the report uh, published by Macmillan and Marie Curie in terms of getting it right for carers supporting someone at the end of life. Their voices are very important in any issues affecting end of life care. And I also want to recognize uh, the longitudinal commitment that Mark Griffin has shown to issues like this. It's also debates like these offer us an opportunity as parliamentarians to pay tribute to the, the 
uh, unpaid carers that support uh, countless people in our country. They are the bedrock uh, on, under which all of our health and social care strata is built. Without their support, uh, everything would collapse. And I'm not being overly dramatic to say that. Um, they do so out of a sense of duty and of love for the people around them. And we often, as policymakers, exploit that love because we couldn't match that care in any kind of public policy offering that we could come up with. My mother-in-law was one such carer. She never thought of herself as that. Her husband, Rob, uh, was diagnosed with MS at the age of 41 and for the last 20 years of his life spent uh, much of that time uh, confined to a chair. She had never really suggested she needed help and we all just assumed that she and Rob were enjoying quiet enjoyment of their life together until one day she confided in me that she'd uh, had to flag down a passing motorist when Rob had had a fall and she'd been too unable to lift him herself and at that point we realized they needed a bit of extra support that that's the quiet dignity that is so commonplace for our unpaid family carers and and they wouldn't seek it otherwise they they believe it's their their time last time this time last year uh, rob went into hospital with an infection and it became apparent very quickly that he actually had a very aggressive form of cancer and something that was going to limit his time with us just to a, a, a matter of days if not weeks uh, the staff in the hospital were excellent. The care he got in the hospital were excellent. But it was a noisy place. It was a place where he was without his home creature comforts. And uh, getting him home, because it was clear that he was beyond the reach of medical care, uh, was our number one priority. We came up against a very complicated landscape that people who are caring for loved ones in that, that situation find all too commonplace. The fact that there wasn't a health and social care package that could be delivered to him in the home meant that his departure from hospital was delayed. It was only after our insistence and the fact that two of his uh, offspring were GPs that the health and social care partnership agreed to release him to our care. And, and thankfully, they did bolt in some support later on. But it was very much Marie Curie nurses who were the cavalry in that situation. I don't think we could have offered Rob those last six days in a quiet bubble of love and light and happiness were it not for their support. They taught us you know, very basic humanitarian things that you wouldn't think of associated with end-of-life care about massaging moisturizer into Rob's arms because his skin was dry uh, and it gave him comfort and companionship. Um, and that support didn't end with Rob's passing and it was if we were to choose the manner of our passing I would choose something like that presiding officer because those nurses gave him that that dignity and that comfort they continued to support our family they they arrived days later days after the funeral with a bouquet of flowers and a private mobile telephone number through which they could be contacted it was a level of support I never expected but for which I am eternally grateful and they are um also supported by other organisations like Cruise Bereavement who are there to offer after life support to carers left behind. Let's remember, and the report states this, that 11,000 people who die in this country don't get the end of life care that they need. One in four miss out on palliative care. Supporting those around them is absolutely vital to improving those vital last days. And that starts with identification. Only 9% recognize their, the fact that they are carers or reveal that to GPs. And that's even worse for young carers too. And we need to do more as a parliament for each of these individuals because behind each of these individuals is the opportunity to offer some of our most vulnerable citizens the, the right and the opportunity to have a dignified and comfortable death. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Annie Bales. Uh, presiding officer, uh, let me uh, thank Mark Griffin for the opportunity to debate uh, this important subject and equally uh, to thank uh, Macmillan uh, and I do so in a personal capacity as a family, as so many others have, have benefited uh, over the years from support uh, from Macmillan uh, uh, in, in terminal illness. Um, it, it's worth saying, as the person here who's statistically closest to death uh, than anyone else who's present, that death is the last great taboo. And therefore, we often do not engage with the idea of death and the necessity of preparing for death in a way that would support 
the person who's departing and those who care for them uh, to an adequate extent. That lack of recognition is part of it. Um, I just make a minor observation that the one thing that hasn't emerged in the debate, which slightly surprised me, I must say, uh, is uh, the role of faith communities in supporting uh, families uh, with terminal ill people. The visit from the priest, from the pastor, from the minister, from an elder of a church uh, can often be a very important part of the support before death, but also uh, in the bereavement process that both Mark Griffin and Monica Lemon Lennon um, uh, re referred to after death. As a GP's son, uh, I'm aware of the conventional view of bereavement that there are five phases and that basically it lasts six months. And it is important, as uh, Monica Lennon and Mark Griffin said, that there is support for people in that phase. Because it does not matter how unexpected a death may be or how long anticipated it is, it is a shock when it happens and the bereavement uh, support uh, for the carer uh, is very, very important in, indeed. Now, of course, modern medicine has created particular problems in this regard. Uh, first of all, people survive a diagnosis of a terminal condition much longer than they used to. They may survive with comorbidities, people with many different conditions, with a complex set of needs and a complex uh, range of support that's required from medical uh, profession. So we create a problem, in a sense, uh, for the system of supporting carers. We expect more of carers through that comorbidity, and we expect longer support because of generally longer survival times after uh, diagnosis. So therefore, this whole issue is becoming more important, has become uh, more important uh, than it ever was. And we can't uh, start to help people understand the process of death, the process of bereavement early enough. It's one of the reasons, it may sound quite trivial, why it's quite important for children to have pets because it confronts uh, for them in their lives the idea that nothing in life is actually forever because pets tend to die. And that is true of us as it is uh, for our pets. So therefore I hope uh, that this debate makes its own modest contribution uh, to engaging us with the idea that death is normal and natural. Indeed, it's important that we move out of the way to allow the next generation uh, to come through. But the, the study that Macmillan's have done is a very valuable contribution to both understanding the pressures on carers and the support and perhaps the support gaps uh, that we now need to address. And as a rural uh, MSP, I in particular point to the difficulties in reaching people in rural areas and identifying carers. They're more likely to be non-identified and lack support in rural areas. Once again, presiding officer, we can never thank Macmillan too much. I do so again. In order to allow our last speaker and indeed the response from the minister, I'm happy to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. I invite Mark Griffin to move a motion without notice. Thank you, presiding officer. Moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Yeah. I'm very pleased about that. And uh, that does not give licence to Ms Wells or the Minister to talk for 30 minutes. Thank you. Annie Wells. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am very grateful to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate. And like others across the Chamber, I too wish to thank Mark Griffin for bringing this topic to the Chamber as well as Marie Curie and Macmillan Cancer Support for their efforts in creating this report. One of my most memorable experiences as an MSP was a visit I made to the Young Carers Festival in West Linton in 2017. Whilst people I met weren't all caring for someone with a palliative illness, it nevertheless brought home just how all-encompassing caring for a loved one can be. And although the children and young people I spoke to I spoke with made no complaints about the situation they were in. It was evident that personal sacrifices had been made and their lives were notice noticeably more difficult than their peers. Particularly when we look to those caring for someone nearing the end of their life, a time which can be emotionally exhausting and for some completely unexpected, 
it's vital we do all that we can to get the right support in place. The Scottish Health Survey estimated in 2016 that there are over 788,000 people caring for a relative, friend or neighbour. Although it's difficult to determine how many people are caring for someone with a palliative illness, we do know that there are approximately 40,000 to 46,000 deaths of people with a terminal illness in, this, in Scotland every year. And across the UK, around 1 in 12 carers are caring for someone with a terminal illness. The main issues, as noted by the report, are that carers are not being identified, sometimes not at all, and for, and for the many, not early enough. Because of this, carers are not being supported, with the consequences being a lack of good care, coordination or no support at all. Often the path into, care, into a caring role can be a gradual one, with many people believing that they are simply carrying out a social role that's expected of them. And like many others have said, carers do not see themselves as such because of the business, of the business of the role and because for many, it's an evolutionary process. The report by Marie Curie and Macmillan notes that a clear need for health professionals to empower carers to self-identify. This could be a simple intervention such as leaflets in GP waiting rooms or a public awareness campaign. And as Rona Mackay alluded to, by empowering carers to self-identify, there is a greater chance of support plans being put in place. To be proactive in that process means that carers can receive financial as well as physical and psychological support. Notably, the report highlighted a lack of knowledge amongst carers when it came to accessing services to meet their needs. Many carers felt hindered by poor communication between health professionals and by not having a central point of contact. With the juggling demands of carers, many of whom still work, it's extremely important that care is carefully coordinated in advance with a central professional who can take care in, terms of, in times of crisis if needed. Moreover, the report also highlights the need for respite, with 23% of carers citing they do not know how to get a break. This needs to be prioritised. And for many carers, sleep deprivation is a major issue and time away from the caring role provided people with the opportunity to maintain their physical and emotional health. To conclude today, I would like again to thank Mark Griffin for bringing this topic to debate. The experience of the death of a loved one is difficult enough to care and nurture someone right to the point of their death even more so. And for this reason, I welcome the publication of this report and I ask that the calls made be duly acted on. I now call Joe Fitzpatrick to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I want to start by adding my congratulations to Mark Griffin on securing this important and um, timely debate. It's been really valuable to hear um, from members uh, across the Chamber highlighting particular pressures on those caring for people with terminal illness and particularly thank uh, the members who gave some of their own personal experiences, particularly Brian Whittle, Alex Cole Hamilton and, and, and Stuart Stevenson um, and, and others. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity this debate provides for us to have a discussion around some of the priorities for supporting people um, who are caring for people um, at a time with a terminal illness. Um, I also want to join others in welcoming the research um, in the report from Marie Curie and Macmillan Cancer Support. It's a very, very valuable piece of work and I think it goes further than, than the, the, the slightly narrower focus that we particularly commissioned um, them, them to take out. So the Scottish Government funded the study um, to inform our work in developing forthcoming regulations on priority timescales for identifying the needs of carers of people with terminal illness. And I think um, Mark Griffin asked about the timescale um, for taking that forward and it's an important point so while I was going to cover it later in in my speech and I, I may do again I think um, I'll try and cover it now just to confirm that we'll be consulting on regulations in in the coming weeks and I'll, I'll talk later hopefully about how, how we've got to the 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 to formulate the regulations that we will be consulting on 
Um, I think it's also worth emphasising that this research was carried out before the new rights under the Carer Scotland Act were put in place last April. That act put in place a system of carers' rights to make carer support more consistent and personalised to individual needs to help protect carers' health and well-being and sustain caring relationships, a number of the points that were made by, by members across the chamber. These rights uh, now extend to all carers so they can access support earlier in their caring journeys. Um, as highlighted in our programme for government, um, we're working to embed these rights for Scotland's 790,000 carers and is, is an ongoing priority. Um, talking about that number of 790,000 carers, Alison Johnson asked um, if we knew the number of young carers who were covering, uh, were caring for people at the end of their lives. And we estimate that there are some 44,000 uh, young carers in Scotland and um, who've, who are, in, who are uh, preventing and providing um, uh, care. Um, as far as I'm aware, we don't currently have the figures in terms of what proportion of those carers um, are providing care for people with a terminal illness. But I, I think as the, the Carers Act beds in, it's likely that that's what those, those numbers will, will come, come, come forward. But it's a, if, if the number's available, then I will, I will try and come back to the member on that. But I'm not, I'm not sure it is as yet. Um, Across the, the, the government, um, there's a number of pieces of work um, which gel with um, the Carers Act. So we also intend to Im improve carers' social security benefits, accelerate the integration um, of health and social care, and reform social care to make sure it's fit for the future. And these are all acts which we, um, actions which should help the overall experience. We've also heard about the importance of making sure carers can access support early and as Bill Kidd said a key aspect of our work um, in helping is uh, helping carers to be aware of their rights to support and how to access that support. Our carers charter summarising carers rights under the act is now widely used across Scotland and there are a series of practical what to expect leaflets by the coalition of carers in Scotland. Advice on uh, carers rights is also accessible through the information and advice services now required in every local area. Um, Mark Griffin, Brian Whittle and Monica Lennon all um, mentioned the importance of carer um, identification. That is an important theme in the report and it's key to getting it right for carers. A main factor in that um, is that staff who come into contact with carers can identify them as a carer and help them access support. So we are supporting local staff training and awareness in a number of ways, including funding and an excellent e-book produced by the Scottish Social Services Council um, and ongoing work um, with national carer organisations and NHS Education Scotland. Uh, Rona Mackay and Annie Wells both talked about uh, the, the the, the empowering um, carers uh, for s to, to self-identify, and but we, we, we absolutely have to make sure the information is, is, is there so that, that, that people understand their rights um, and, 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 and feel empowered in that way. And that's, um, it's also important, I think, to mention the new duty to involve carers when people are discharged from hospital, which is an excellent opportunity to identify carers at an early stage. Annie Wells um, mentioned um, short breaks, I think. So alongside care identification, the report highlights the value of breaks from caring. And under the Carers Act, authorities must now consider whether um, uh, support should include um, a break from caring. And we're continuing to fund non-statutory short breaks fund, um, which was spent over £26 million on, um, on since 2010. Um, the motion and rightly and, and the report rightly highlight the need for coordination of support and that's central to the new carers um, support plans and young carer statements which are at the heart of the carers act all carers now have the right to one of these plans uh, to event identify their own personal outcomes and individual needs they also provide uh, tailored information about support available uh, locally future care planning and what support the local authorities will provide. Mark Griffin asked about the numbers of support plans and young carers statements that had, had been requested um, and that's information that we have um, asked um, uh, 
from uh, local authorities. Um, we've asked for the first six months figures, so they're not yet available, but we are, we are requesting them and we'll make sure that, that um, members um, uh, see those figures when, when they become available, because that will be a, a test about just how um, awareness of the Carers Act is, is filtering across the, the, the country. Um, while scrutinising the Carers Bill, that this Parliament decided that carers of people with a terminal illness should, should have priority access to these plans, and that will require legislation. And, and as I said earlier, we commissioned this report um, from Macmillan and Marie Curie to inform that work. So we've been working with both organisations on proposals for these regulations, which we are about to publish for consultation in the coming, coming weeks. So local authorities and health and social care partners tell us they are already prioritising these carers, but we want to, to have regulations to ensure they receive support quickly um, and without compromising the quality of support um, or creating unnecessary bureaucracy. Monica Lennon um, asked me about bereavement support and under the Carers Act, every local authority um, area um, Carer information and advice services has to provide information and advice on bereavement and support for, for carers. And that's one of the things that I think as, as the Act is implemented, we need to teach, make sure that is happening and that's the experience on the ground because that, that's what's very important. To close, Presiding Officer, I want to acknowledge uh, the contributions from across the Chamber and also the excellent work of Macmillan and Marie Curie. But most importantly, I want to acknowledge the contribution of carers looking after loved ones with a terminal illness. And I want to reiterate the, cover, the commitment um, to doing what we can to make sure that they can access the support that they need and deserve when they need it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That concludes the debate, and this meeting is suspended until half past two.